As winter approaches, European nations are all experiencing a huge second wave of new COVID-19 cases. However, COVID-19 deaths are not rising quite as sharply, though they're still certainly rising. What does all this mean? And how does this pandemic look on a worldwide scale? Let's find out. For this video's data visualization, I'm taking inspiration from Hans Rosling's famous Gapminder website, where every country is depicted with a single bubble, and the size of the bubble reflects the country's population. In my graph, the x-axis shows how many new COVID-19 cases each country reported per capita per day, and the y-axis shows how many new COVID-19 deaths each country reported per capita per day. Both scales are logarithmic, so every distance between two grid lines depicts about a doubling in number. Small bubble movements reflect big real world trends. The time dimension is not shown visually on this graph. Instead, it's animated, which is why you can start to see China increase in cases and deaths as the clock reaches late January. The blue color of China's bubble indicates it's an Asian country. All country bubbles will be colored based on their continent, as depicted in this key. So in this visualization, if a country suddenly has a surge in cases but nobody has died yet, a country's bubble will travel purely rightward in the direction of more cases. But as that first wave of people starts dying, which typically happens about two weeks later than cases, the bubble will start to move upwards in the direction of more deaths. Then, as the wave of infections subsides and cases wind down, the bubble will move left, even if the deaths of people who were infected two weeks ago are still high. Eventually though, the last victims of the first wave will die off, and the bubble will move downward. So in conclusion, a typical wave of COVID-19 cases might look like this movement in a counterclockwise cycle. By the end of February, China's reported number of cases and deaths were already falling below those of Italy, Iran, and South Korea, the last of which had a helpful head start on COVID-19 testing due to their preparation from their 2015 MERS outbreak. That brings me to a downside of this visualization. I'm still using Worldometer's reported case numbers, which can't possibly account for unknown cases due to lack of testing. At this point in early March, the United States probably already had thousands of cases, but we weren't aware of them, so neither is this visualization. Either way, March was really the month where the bulk of European countries and the United States, in its uniquely bronze color, started rising significantly in cases. Mid-March was when the WHO officially declared COVID-19 a pandemic, pan meaning all meaning multiple continents, including the purple bubbles of South America and the yellow bubbles of Africa. Italy's high median age of 45 meant it had a larger elderly population more vulnerable to the virus, which likely led to their higher fatality rate of 10%. This brings me to the topic of these diagonal red ratio lines I've drawn on this graph. What are they? Well, suppose a country has 100 cases and 5 deaths. You could safely say that's a 5% fatality rate, right? Now if that country triples in both cases and deaths, a aka a movement to the upper right, that ratio stays the same at 5%. So, the collection of all possible situations where there are 5% as many deaths as cases can be represented with that diagonal line labeled 5%. You might be wondering why China is suddenly jumping up vertically, meaning a ton of new deaths but no new cases. That's because in mid-April, Wuhan revised its death toll to include people who had died at home, despite the fact that their wave of COVID-19 had subsided a month earlier. For simplicity's sake, I'm choosing not to correct for this blip in data. Here's another element of this graph. I've also included typical rates of influenza, aka the seasonal flu, and the 2014 West African Ebola outbreak. The WHO reports that around 1 billion people get the flu each year, the vast majority of cases being mild. But only around half a million die from the flu, resulting in a fatality rate of 0.05%. The CDC reports similar numbers for swine flu, also known as H1N1, in the year of 2009. Now, the 1918 Spanish flu was so long ago that the only data of their case counts is rough estimates. Regardless, the best guess is that about one third of all humans alive at the time contracted the disease, and anywhere between 3 and 20% of those infected died of it, making it the worst pandemic in modern human history by far, with tens of millions of deaths. Meanwhile, for the 2014 Ebola outbreak, which affected the countries of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, had only 28,000 cases and 11,000 deaths, resulting in a fatality rate of a staggering 40%. Okay, you might have just seen France's dot pass right over Ebola's, and a lot of other European nations are close by. That's frightening, did COVID-19 briefly become as deadly as organ hemorrhaging Ebola? The answer is no. Remember that in May, many of these European countries were on the trailing end of their first wave. That's late enough in the cycle that reports of new cases had already subsided due to lockdowns and regulations, but still early enough in the cycle that people who had been infected weeks earlier at the height of the wave were still dying. In fact, if regulations are strict enough to nearly completely stop the spread of new cases, 
there might be a day where the country experiences more new deaths than new cases, which under this visualization might be labeled as a fatality rate of over 100%. On the surface, that might not seem to make any logical sense. So just be aware that there can be many causes of a fatality rate being extremely high or low. Next, notice how we're approaching the end of June and the beginning of July, which is summer in the Northern Hemisphere and winter in the Southern Hemisphere. Now take a close look, which countries are currently suffering from COVID-19 the worst? It's Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Bolivia, all countries in South America, labeled in purple. Their coldest months correlate with the highest rates of disease. Meanwhile, the green countries of the Northern Hemisphere, who are currently basking in summertime, have all fallen about 90% from their peaks about three months ago. Of course, correlation does not imply causation, so I definitely don't want to outright state that the warming of Europe in the summer led to the rates going down, or the cooling of South America led to the rates going up. Other factors, like personal hygiene, mask wearing, and governmental actions like lockdowns and travel bans, all have huge effects on how much COVID-19 will spread throughout a country. But still, these overall seasonal trends are definitely something to keep an eye out for. Next, I definitely don't want to leave out the largest active bubble of them all, India. It's the giant blue dot just to the right of the center of the screen, representing 1.38 billion people compared to China's 1.44 billion people. Now, this entire scatter plot is measuring everything per capita. So even though the countries suffering the worst per capita right now are the purple South American countries, their populations are all so much lower than India's that actually, by mid-August, India was the country receiving the highest raw count of new COVID-19 cases per day, at roughly 60,000. Being near the equator, I don't think India's seasonal trends will be as extreme as Europe's, although cases have slowed down about 50% between September and the current day. In mid-September, New Zealand sadly experienced their 25th COVID-19 death. Fortunately, there have been no deaths in that country since then, so you can see New Zealand's red bubble drop to the x-axis and stay there for the remainder of the video. As October approaches, the Southern Hemisphere warms in the spring and the Northern Hemisphere cools in the autumn. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, Europe is experiencing a second wave that is, in some ways, worse than the first. Like a lava lamp, the purple dots are rotating counterclockwise above the green dots. And even record-breaking Argentina is starting to retreat to the left. But what's different about Europe's second wave is that it's much further to the right than the first wave. Remember how Italy started with a fatality rate of nearly 10% and her neighbors were close by? This time, most countries are clumping around the 1% rate. Is this because governments, hospitals, doctors, and health professionals are better prepared this time around to treat COVID-19 patients when they come in so fewer of them die? That's probably part of it, but could it also be in part because deaths lag behind cases by about two weeks, placing Europe in the lower right stage of this counterclockwise cycle? Maybe. Another theory that I don't personally believe in is that this drop in fatality rate might have to do with COVID-19 mutations making it more contagious and less deadly. I just haven't seen the evidence for that, but I'm not an epidemiologist, so I shouldn't be making any statements in that field. Anyway, on October 30th, the United States was the first country in the world to report over 100,000 cases of COVID-19 in one day, more than China got in its entire lifetime. And by November 6th, the US was up to 132,000 per day and 10 million total. Not good. But just like Europe, the US's death rate is not rising as rapidly, with only about 1,000 deaths a day, which is still tragic, but lower than before. So, are we denizens of the Northern Hemisphere heading towards a nasty winter, with new cases coming in faster than ever before? Or is this lower 1% fatality rate a sign that things are a little more under control? I have no idea. Okay, for the rest of the video, I'll go through the timeline again really fast, but I'll highlight and trace one country's path in particular so you can really see the shape of the trajectory it makes. In this case, we're watching the United States zip around, and maybe you'll be able to see its three waves. I'll also talk about irrelevant things in the background as I choose other random countries and graph their paths too. Next, I want to return to the influenza dot in the lower right and compare. Some people say COVID-19 is no worse than the flu. Is that true? Well, some countries like Israel are experiencing the same number of cases from COVID-19 as the flu, and other countries like Egypt are experiencing the same number of deaths as the flu. But looking at both dimensions at once, we can see the two pictures are nowhere near the same. If you sign up for the same number of cases as the flu, you're going to get 10 times more deaths of COVID-19. And if you sign up for the same number of deaths as the flu, that would have happened solely because fewer people got infected in the first place. 
If you choose to believe that the numbers from the start are being faked by doctors for ulterior motives, consider that we're receiving data from around 200 countries. When we look at the graph of all this data as a whole, we can see patterns emerge, such as the clumping of countries from the same continent, or the counterclockwise movements of each wave. In order for this data to be faked, a significant portion of the 200 countries would all have to be colluding at once, including countries from Europe, East Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Oceania, the Americas, and more. So which do you think is more likely? That all these countries, who disagree on thousands of other issues, have all decided to lie together in this instance? Or that we're simply going through another deadly pandemic, as has happened countless times throughout history, such as the 1918 Spanish flu? Next, let me remind you that I'm using logarithmic scales for both the horizontal and vertical axes of this graph. And that has both pros and cons. Here's one huge downside. The amount of real-world impact it takes to get from the bottom of the screen to the middle is way less than what it takes to get from the middle of the screen to the top. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look at Egypt. It seems to travel about halfway up the screen, in fact, slightly more than half. So intuitively, you might conclude that Egypt's COVID-19 death rate is about half as bad as it got in the worst countries. But take a closer look at that logarithmic scale. Egypt never surpassed one death per million per day. On the other hand, when Belgium goes way up and touches the top of the screen, it's surpassing 20 deaths per million per day. So despite what it might look like, COVID-19 in Egypt didn't get to about half as bad as it did in Belgium, it barely got to 1 20th as bad as it got in Belgium. Belgium. In other words, on a logarithmic scale, 90% of the real-world impact sits at the higher edges of the screen. As many people die if you move from the very bottom of the screen to the second highest line, as moving from the second highest line to the highest line. So if this is such a problem, why did it choose logarithmic over linear in the first place? Simple. To make the trends of lesser affected countries, like South Korea, New Zealand, and those in Africa, visible. On a linear scale, most bubbles would just be clustered in the lower left corner, making their movements invisible. That brings me to my second pet peeve with the scales I've been using. I label everything as per capita per day. So you might see that a country is hitting one death per million people per day, and think, one in a million? That's so rare. That's literally the saying we use to describe something unbelievably unique. So COVID-19 is nothing to worry about. But it's a bit deceiving just because of how short a day really is. If we observe what happens to a country over the course of a year, that's 365 days. So if one in a million people die per day, 365 people will die in a year, which is now only one in 2,700. That's about the size of a large high school. So, if you imagine you're back in high school, and a disease randomly infects 20 students, leaves 5 with lifelong health effects, and one dies never to be seen again, that would be a tragic event that everyone would take seriously. But that situation on this graph would be labeled as 1 in a million deaths per day. Kinda downplays it all. If that's the case though, why didn't I just use the unit deaths per capita per year, which would give larger numbers that people would take seriously? Well, if I did, it wouldn't really reflect the fact that these rates are literally changing every day. Suppose 10 people died in a car crash today, but after that we never had a car crash ever again. Then, the current death rate on the day of the crash would technically be 3,650 deaths per year. But that feels deceiving in its own way, because nowhere near 3,000 people even died, only 10 did. So, whereas per capita per day gives an underwhelming image, per capita per year gives an overwhelming one. Both are mathematically correct, of course. But in the end, I decided to go with per day because the story is changing per day. Regardless of these technical details, though, the conclusion is that COVID-19 is by no means over, and we still need to take it seriously. The changing of a president or the changing of a new year is not going to give us a clean slate when it comes to this virus. So keep social distancing and wearing masks, as inconvenient as it may be. You will be saving lives. Hey guys, so before this video ends, I just wanted to give a quick shout out again to this website called COVID Loader, created by Mahmoud Hikmet, which uses projections based on the most up-to-date data on COVID-19 cases and deaths to sort of predict the rates at which different countries are getting new cases and new deaths. So since the United States is getting about 100,000 cases a day, you can sort of interpolate that to be about one case every 0.7 seconds. So the website plays a little dink sound every time there's a new case, and a low rumble sound every time there's a new death. 
it still helps give an overall picture of how quickly COVID-19 is taking over the world and just how many people are being affected by this deadly disease. Humans aren't great with looking at numbers, but they're really great at sensory input, like sounds and visuals. So I just think that that's why this is so helpful. And yes, I've shouted this out before, but I just think that it's worth shouting out again. Okay, thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you later. Bye!